Hey Valve community, yes that's right, it's finally here, that moment you've all been waiting for, it's my top 10 favorite records of all time, the uh, culmination of <laughs> the past several months of my channel, um, it's week by week going 10 at a time, you know the deal, if, um, if this is my first video of mine that you've seen, welcome, um, if you've never seen a VC video before, this is um, kind of a thing that has been going around somewhat. Um, where we just show 100 favorite records. It's really that simple. Um, there's no <laughs> rules really. You can kind of do whatever you want with it. And uh, I've really been enjoying everybody else's lists. And uh, I've kind of been hopeful that uh, some more of you guys will do it because I'd really love to see those. Anyways, um, I got to get into these because I'm worried that I'm going to uh, probably rant too long about each one. So I'll try to keep these somewhat brief. Um, Top 10, here we go. Number 10 is the classic, my favorite uh, record by the Beatles. You can see <laughs> their name embossed right there. Of course, the White Album. Um, if you must know, there's my, uh, that's what number I have. It's an original US, uh, on the Apple, all that good stuff, stereo, yada yada yada. Um, there's hundreds of pressings of this record. Anyways, um, music on here. Um, kind of an interesting vibe for a Beatles record, very unique. Um, I think Jeff Barty's kind of mentioned, especially in the, like, the later parts of the album, there's this kind of um, almost like sinister kind of vibe to it, with tracks like um, obviously Helter Skelter, but then um, you got Savoy Truffle, Cry Baby Cry, and of course Revolution 9. Um, which is just a crazy, crazy, uh, you can't even really call it a song. Um, it's just a sound collage or uh, what do you call it, music concrete. Um, experimental for sure. Um, all over the place musically, a lot of people do not like this record. I can understand why. Um, songwriting though, um, I think a lot of them are at the top of their game or George Harrison is kind of going flowering into his own uh, songwriter, really, um, probably one of my favorite Harrison tracks ever is on here, Long, 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 and then he also did Savoy Truffle, um, he, uh, he did Piggies, which is one of his weakest songs ever, and uh, on track, or on side one, of course, the classic While My Guitar Gently Weeps, um, and then I might as well go with each Beatle, uh, Ringo, of course, wrote his first song ever, um, I'm blanking on it for some reason, Don't Pass Me By, lots of great John tracks on here, Dear Prudence is one of his best, Glass Onion's great, um, Bungalow Bill, eh, you know, I love Happiness is a Warm Gun though, and uh, Sexy Sadie, um, not a big fan of the uh, version of Revolution that's on here, Revolution 1, but uh, Your Blues, their kind of blues rock track is really great, and then you got McCartney's, you know, Blackbird, um, Back in the USSR, um, Mother Nature's Son, um, just just a fantastic record. All of them are really strong and um, kind of uh, almost like peak musicianship. Um, only only comes close, in my opinion, with Sgt. Pepper and Abbey Road, which were earlier on in my list, but uh, those are my favorite Beatles record and my number 10 favorite record of all time. I don't really think it needs much of an explanation. Uh, number nine here is my favorite Neil Young is uh, Tonight's the Night. Again, kind of a darker record. I should have Gayful here. Um, he's going through some interesting emotions here with the death of, uh, of the guitarist from Crazy Horse. I think it's Bruce Berry and name drops in the first track. Um, this is... Uh, Original reprise, pressing, black label, all that good stuff. Um, tonight's the night, you know, the bookend, the, the album, open and close. You got Speaking Out, Roll on a String, Borrowed Tune, Let's Go Downtown, uh, Roll Another Number for the Road, Albuquerque, New Mama, Look Out Joe, Tired Eyes, which is my, probably my favorite new other track, honestly. And then, like I said, Tonight's the Night Part 2. So that's the track listing. Um, he sounds completely either drunk or stoned or some combination, um, completely high. He 
he is just out of it. He, not that it's a bad performance at all. This is probably his best performance, but uh, in terms of um, his, uh, what would you call that? His like um, personality being there, he's like completely gone. He's just kind of in the studio, sort of, I wouldn't even say going through the motions, but like, I would kind of compare it to um, how Bowie said that he has no memory of recording Station to Station. I would be surprised if Young has any memory of recording this record, um, just in terms of how drugged up he sounds. Um, and yet, still a great performance, like I said, vocally and uh, guitar and piano-wise and all that. But um, yeah, the rest of the band's really strong too. I can't say I know too many of them by name, honestly. Uh, and I don't think they're listed anywhere on here that I can find anyway, but um, my favorite Neil Young, not by a whole lot, but it's close. Um, part of his Ditch Trilogy, which he referred to as his Ditch Trilogy, where after the commercial success of like, after the Gold Rush and Harvest, he kind of purposefully, not sabotaged, but kind of wanted to uh, get a little bit out of the limelight or off of the, uh, out of the mainstream avenue that he felt he was going down he said he headed straight for the ditch and um that really comes through on a record like this you know i think this was pushed back um a couple years because the label didn't want to release it because it was just so loose and weird and and um again he's kind of out there but he really made something kind of special here um in terms of like grief and um general depression and uh <laughs> Neil Young Canadian sadness. So, um, yeah, favorite Neil Young, number nine. And number eight. Um, I was surprised this wasn't in the top three, honestly, but it is number eight. It landed where it landed. It's uh, Nick Drake's Pink Moon. You all know the opening track, Pink Moon. It's fantastic. This is a, not a first press, maybe second or third press UK on this uh, island label here. Um, anyways, the songs, um, maybe it's only just because I know where he would go within a couple months of recording these, but, um, the songs have this kind of weight to them that almost, um, you can see the track listing there and all the lyrics. It almost like, um, feels kind of apocalyptic on certain tracks, especially, the one that's coming to mind right now is Things Behind the Sun. You listen to the like the final 30 seconds of that song and it's just like so heavy. And um, again, the weight of it. Um, weight is probably the best term to use. Um, and some of the lyrics here, um, you'll find reasons why people frown at things you say, but say what you'll say about the farmers and the fun and the things behind the sun and the people around your head who say everything's been said and the movement in your brain sends you out into the rain. That's some heavy uh, Nick Drake there. Um, and again, there's tons of lighter moments on here, like No and um, From the Morning. Um, just true beauty on this record, I think I've mentioned before. I've definitely talked about this recently too. And um, the artwork is something to behold for sure. It's kind of a, it really stands out. It's pretty, even the spine, it stands out on the on the shelves. You know, you can spot a phone from across the room. Um, and uh, I'm a big fan of Brighter Later, especially. I'm not. I don't know what it is about Five Leaves Left that I can't really get into as heavy as the, his last two. But um, all of his discography is great. All his studio albums, um, all his unreleased, like all the bootlegs you can find, and. Um, you know, rare tracks, B-sides, all that stuff. That's all great. He had, I don't think he recorded a single bad song, honestly. But Pink Moon is really something special and, and really stands out even in all of musical history. And especially to me, it kind of resonates well with me, which is the whole point of this list. So it lands at uh, number eight in my list. Number seven, another one which I was kind of surprised got bumped down by some of the ones ahead of it because I just love, love this record. But it's... Um, Another Green World by Brian Eno. Um, real quick about the album artwork, I think Jeff Kempen has mentioned how, um, or maybe it was um, Dean from Grandma's Handbag, but so one of you guys mentioned how the album artwork kind of perfectly somehow describes what the album sounds like, and I think that's absolutely true. I mean, it's um, kind of minimalist, 
slightly expressionist and yet so colorful and kind of evokes a mood or an atmosphere that um, I think Eno was really good at, at creating. But um, yeah, it's another green world. There he is on the back. Uh, I don't remember the story of this record too well. Off the top of my head, it was something like he was in hospital after surgery or um, injury of some kind. He was in there for several weeks or months, and he um, he brought a bunch of musical equipment, or he had people bring musical um, equipment, synthesizers, and and things like that into the his hospital room where he would just begin experimenting with sounds and, and things and. Um, he had this card system, or like a set of cards he and another artist made that I, again, I'm forgetting the name of, but it would, it'd be like random combinations of words or of like adjectives that would describe kind of a, I don't even, I don't even know. It would, it would evoke an atmosphere or feeling again that I will say that a big part of this record obviously is, I keep saying the word atmosphere, but a feeling or aesthetic, whatever you want to call it, general mood, or texture of a, of a song, um, he, it would come up like track one uh, is called Sky Saw, and that kind of perfectly describes what the song sounds like. The guitar in that in that um, in that track sounds like a giant electrical saw in the sky. And um, there's another um, there's a credit on here that he plays snake guitar because there is another guitar part that I think he described as like a snake rolling through the bushes, which is pretty accurate. Um, we got St. Elmo's Fire with uh, Robert Fripp featured there on uh, Windhurst Guitar, which I think was a guitar fed through twin <laughs> like radio um, receivers or something like that. And um, just crazy, crazy um, experimental sounds like that. I don't really know if anyone's attempted to recreate some of the sounds in this album, but I'd be curious to see how they were made or if even Eno could recreate them. Um, because they were just experimenting like crazy. Um, I think Phil Collins plays, trum plays drums on all of these tracks. And he was, um, oh, John Cale too from uh, Velvet Underground. Anyway, um, they would just be in the studio and he would be doing what he described as like a paint by, or a, um, yeah, you call it paint by numbers. Like a paint by numbers um, approach to songwriting is like, um, let's try, I think he said like, let's try a, a sequence where we play G sharp there and then the next verse we'll do it as an F or he would just like make it up as he was, as he was going along and the lyrics um, are kind of similar where he would just kind of ad-lib or hum along nonsense to uh, the melody that he wanted and wrote the lyrics in later but I'm kind of rambling now um, Another Green World is uh, crazy influential and definitely, I think, is the peak of Eno's catalog, and um, has become kind of a kind of a fan favorite or a cult classic. As time went on, it wasn't as well received as his earlier rock records, but um, it was um, kind of giving a hint forward as, as to what he would really do for music and electronic music, especially or art rock or whatever you want to call it—a mix of electronic and, and rock music. Number seven, another green world. So number six is my favorite out of the big three uh, mid '60s Dylan record. Of course, I'm talking about Blonde on Blonde. Um, let me pull the full cover out. Let's see if I can do that without dropping the records out of the gatefold. There he is. I can't tell if that's a great photograph or a terrible photograph. Um, <laughs> it's just Dylan. This is a '70s repress in stereo. You can see. It's got this gatefold and um, the classic 70s Columbia labels, um, which this is a pretty minty copy, but I would love to get um, a 60s pressing in general, but a 60s mono if I could, but those are uh, pretty expensive. Anyway, Blonde on Blonde, um, you could call it his psych record. I mean, it's still, you know, it's bluesy. It's kind of, um, he's, he's got, uh, what's his name from the band? Um, Oh jeez, I want to butcher this now. Where is he? Uh, who's Robertson from the band? He played keyboard or organ or whatever. Anyway, his, his touring band would you know be the band uh, for many of these songs and on Highway 61 Revisited as well. But um, 
Man, why can't I see his name on here? Al Cooper's on here. Um, Charlie McCoy, Wayne Moss. Um, recorded in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, anyways, all, the songs on here, um, you've got I Want You, probably the lead single. Um, one of my favorite Dylan tracks of all time, Visions of Joanna. Another one of my favorites is um, Side-Eyed Lady of the Lowlands, which closes it. I think that's the only song on side four. Um, you've got... Um, just Like a Woman, um, Rainy Day Women, number 12 and 35, Absolutely Sweet Marie, Most Likely You'll Go Your Way and I'll Go Mine, um, Fourth Time Around, just peak Dylan songwriting. I say the word peak all the time, but um, again, that's kind of my opinion. This is my favorite Dylan, obviously. Um, what can I say about it? It's just, um, his, I think he... I think everyone would agree that this is uh, definitely the peak, again, I'm using that word, peak of his um, experimentation that he would use um, in terms of what he could do with like a rock sound. Because um, then after this he would do, he would go kind of regress, he would have a motorcycle crash and regress back to Woodstock and, and write uh, John Wesley Harding. And then after that he would do Nashville Skyline and then kind of never looked back, went on to uh, you know his 70s output, stuff like... Um, Blood on the Tracks and Desire, but he never really went back to the straight ahead rock, um, bluesy, maybe southern tinged psychedelic thing he was doing on here, which which I really love that period of him. Um, it's just blonde on blonde. What more can I say? So that brings me to, uh, to four five right here. Um, the newest record in this bunch anyways um it's an original pressing i don't know if i've shown this before or not but it's an original of um, sufian stevens illinois or if you want to say the complete title you could say sufian stevens invites you to come on feel the illinois um again original pressing you can tell because it has this balloon sticker on the front that's actually covering up superman which they had to do for copyright reasons i don't know if you can kind of see him underneath it but um, these have actually gone down in price a little bit. There's some good copies on Discogs that you can get for cheaper than I bought this for, admittedly. But um, yeah, that artwork is, is something. Um, it's a triple gatefold, so there's the front, you know, uh, Chicago Skyline, Sears Tower, there's the goat. I forgot who that is. Um, here we have a Black Hawk. There's Sufian right there next to John Wayne Gacy Jr. Which is really scary. Um, Cardinal, which I believe is the national bird of Illinois. And then inside the gatefolds, uh, let me turn this around, sorry. Inside the gatefold, we got uh, Mary Todd Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, and Santa Claus, and some uh, deer. But um, yeah, it's, uh, I guess you could just call it Chamber Pop. Here's his uh, band at the time of this record, um, and he called them the Illinois Makers. Um, so, Sufjan Stevens, um, if you haven't heard, listened to him before, which he was in the most recent video in this series, I've talked about Carrie and Lowell, um, but he has kind of a, he's one of the best current songwriters I think there is, singer-songwriters. Um, he has a great, sweet, beautiful voice. <laughs> he, uh, almost sounds like a kind of boyish or um, at least on this record he sounds kind of boyish almost like um, like a choir boy or something honestly but it really works for his his style and uh, check out those those tracks on there the names of those I mean track two is the Black Hawk War which you could call it that colloquially it's the Black Hawk War or how to demolish an entire civilization and still feel good about yourself in the morning or we apologize for the inconvenience but you're going to have to leave now or I have fought the big knives and I will continue to fight them until they are off our lands. So <laughs> that's the kind of thing we're dealing with. Lots of these tracks have insanely long titles like that, just run on sentences. And yet a lot of those will be 20 seconds long, eight seconds long, 60 seconds long. I mean, really it, each side flows as one continuous piece of music. Um, and a uh, bonus track on here, The Avalanche. 
and then the highlights on here. If you've never listened to a Super Fans Demon song before, I think this one has the perfect one to listen to. It's um, track 10 here. It's called Casimir Pulaski Day. It's about as straightforward Sufjan Stevens as you can get. It's um, it's just him and an acoustic guitar, then a banjo comes in, then a soft um, electronic organ and some trumpet, and that's it. I think there's some female backing vocals, but um, it's not gonna blow your mind instrumentally or anything, but the song itself, I won't spoil it, but it's a very great song. And then you got other ones on here, um, Come on, Philly, Illinois, um, part one and two. You got Man of Metropolis That Steals Our Hearts, John Wayne Gacy Jr., which is soul crushing because this is about the serial killer. And um, Predatory Wasp with the Palisades is out to get us. Um, Chicago, obviously. That one was on the um, Little Miss Sunshine soundtrack. Uh, Sears Tower, kind of an apocalyptic, uh, apocalyptic um, telling of supposedly the end of the world as he um, looks out at the Sears Tower. It's kind of an interesting song. He has a lot to say about Christianity because he is a Christian. Um, and again, we didn't know it at the time, but he's kind of also telling the story of his life, again, through uh, metaphors and, and talking about the state of Illinois. He does you know, main drop several cities on here, specific locations, obviously people. Um, uh, let's see. Just, you know, he's, he's celebrating Illinois, just like he did with Michigan. And just like um, Carrie Ann Lowell is, is kind of in a weird way connected to Oregon. It's his 50 states project that he's supposedly going to do an album for all 50 states. Um, we'll see how that goes. But yeah, he's, I think this is his best record from uh, 2005. There's another train, which happened in my last video. Sometimes there'll be one that goes by every probably 30 minutes. Sometimes we'll go like six hours without one. I don't really understand it. Anyways, number four. I bet you're wondering where all the Smiths and Morrissey has been in this list. Morrissey got squeezed out of my top 100, and um, I think only two two Smiths and Mech records made it in here. But uh, this is the my favorite Smiths record is Queen Is Dead. Um, this is an original U.S. press, which I just recently got. It is a club edition, but I don't really mind. Um, I love that photo of them in there in front of the Salford Lads Club, and then all the the lyrics here. Uh, I think the colors on this record work very well with that kind of pink mixed with the olive green. Original U.S. Press, it's the higher label. You've all seen this before. I just recently got this. Anyway, musically, definitely my favorite Smiths record. Um, opens with the title track, Queen is Dead, which I think is instrumentally at least one of their best songs. And the lyrics are nothing to shake a stick at either. Um, you got, frankly, Mr. Shankly, I Know It's Over, Never Had No One Ever, which I think is probably the weakest on the whole album. Uh, Cemetery Gates, which is one of the strongest in the whole catalog. Um, Big Mouth Strikes Again, huge single. Boy With a Thorn in His Side, huge single. Vicar in a Tutu. There Is a Light That Never Goes Out, probably their biggest song. Um, and I really love the guitar part and Some Girls Are Bigger Than Others, um, which... Lyrically, is nothing special, honestly, but that Johnny Marr guitar part. I think, you know my channel name is My Friend Morrissey. I might as well change it to My Friend Johnny Marr. He's probably the thing that keeps me coming back to the Smiths. Him and, um, uh, I think Andy Rourke plays bass, Mike Joyce is on drums. Great rhythm section. And Morrissey's vocals and lyrics are, um, they are what they are. I know, I know some people could could really never listen to a Morrissey track ever again and be perfectly happy. They hate his voice. Some people can never listen to Dylan either, but you know, he um, he is what he is. He is the person that he is, not that I will support or condone stuff that he says half the time, but um, they made some damn good music for the Smiths. I don't have to defend this album, you know. Um, so number three, I don't know if I numbered that one correctly, but that was four. Number three here, is my favorite Joy Division record, Closer. Um, it's their last record, they only made two, because um, their singer, 
Ian Curtis committed suicide um, shortly before this album was going to be released, which kind of caused a panic with the um, album artwork, which I think is beautiful. But you know, it's a it's a funeral. How would it? How does it look? Putting out a record with a funeral on the cover after your singer commits suicide. But you know, I think it's it's a beautiful cover. It really suits it well, and. Um, I couldn't really think of a better cover for this album, honestly. It is it is dark. It is mute, moody. Um, there's the factory label, factory records, of course. Um, 1980, this album. Um, what am I trying to say? So, this record sounds different production-wise to uh, Unknown Pleasures. Um, opens with Atrocity Exhibition. Isolation, which is kind of, um, I think they were trying to go for more of a radio-friendly post-punk sound with, there's some synthesizer on there. Then you got Passover, which is fantastic. Colony, <laughs> Colony is one of their um, heavier songs, or faster-paced songs, which is great. Means to an End. And then on uh, Side 2, you got Heart and Soul. Side 2, I think, is probably one of my favorite um, album sides of all time. Heart and Soul, 24 Hours, The Eternal, and Decades. Decades is probably my favorite album closer of all time. I I honestly don't know if you can top this one side. I mean, the next one comes close. The next album on my list comes close, and so does the a couple of others on here. But man, look at that. If you have never heard this record before, I might even suggest to skip the first side and just go straight to the second side, just go through these four tracks. And that is a perfect album side in my opinion. Anyways, I'm rambling about that now. Um, heavy, it's dark, it's cold, it's, um, it feels isolated, it feels probably exactly how Ian Curtis wanted it to feel and how he probably felt himself, but um, not to get too depressing there, but uh, it's, uh, it's just good music. It's just good music. So number two, Kind of similar um, in some, certain ways to the Joy Division record, but number two is David Bowie's Low. Um, some of you might be surprised of how high this ended up. I was kind of surprised too, but you know, for this top 10, I really <laughs> spent a long time debating. It's the classic desert island disc scenario where, okay, if I could only have 10 records on an island forever, um, what would they be? It ended up being this 10. I narrowed it down. If I can only have nine, if I can only have eight, seven, six, five, four, and then if I can only have two, this would be one of the two I, could, I would take because I don't know if I could live without it, um, aside from the number one. But um, it's low, 77 in his Berlin trilogy, the first in his Berlin trilogy. Um, this just got a reissue finally, so if you don't have a copy of this, um, I've heard the reissues are good from the from the new career in a new town box set. It's the same kind of thing they've been doing with this whole catalog. I heard their decent pressings. I mean, this is just on 70s RCA Dynaflex. It's nothing really special, um, which I should pull it out and show you. It's, you know, on the black um, RCA with uh, the His Master's Voice thing right there. It's pretty flimsy vinyl. Um, sounds decent on my table, but again, it feels kind of low quality. And then, um, yeah, I don't know, but musically, he did the same thing, which I think I mentioned on Heroes, where side one is um, all his his rock tracks, and side two is all the more electronic experimentations um, or instrumental soundscapes he was doing with Eno. Um, and uh, you all know Sound and Vision, I think, ends up on a lot of greatest hits compilations of his. Um, I really love What Is It, which I think is track three. Oh, funny connection to Joy Division. Um, on Unknown Pleasures, they, which came out in 79, uh, this album came out in 77, they heard the opener, Speed of Life, which um, they wanted to try to replicate the drum sound on that track, and Martin Hannett was having a hard time with it. But, um, you know, you got Speed of Life, Breaking Glass, What in the World, which is the track I was trying to talk about, Sound and Vision, Always Crashing the Same Car, Be My Wife, New Career in a New Town, and then side two is the experimental one. I was talking about Warsaw, Art Decade, Weeping Wall, and Subterraneans, which is 
probably my favorite on that whole side. Um, Worst of all comes close to, which is a heavy Brian Eno track. Um, who I think Eno probably gets a little more credit than he really deserves for the way this record sounds. I mean, he was not the producer, if I'm getting it right. He just was featured a lot on instruments. And, um, you know, it was all Tony Visconti and Bowie. And, um, you know, it was just kind of there hanging out, being part of the part of the fun, which he liked to do. And this album, I would probably compare not not like a brother to Another Green World, but probably a very close cousin. I'm having a hard time getting this answer back in here. Anyways, it's low. It's David Bowie. It's it's David Bowie, which brings me to number one, which is not David Bowie. It's uh, it's Radiohead. It's okay, computer. I think I may have given it away in my last video. Um, if people that say that no good music has, or no good rock music has been made post Nirvana, uh, this album proves proves all that wrong, in my opinion. Um, in lots of weird ways, it, it's kind of um, still relevant in new ways today than it even was um, 11 years ago now, close to 11 years. Um, because even just the title, OK Computer, um, we have all these things, these pieces of technology in our homes now where you say, like, um, you say, OK Google or, or whatever. I'm sorry if I just triggered anybody's home home system thing or whatever. But it's just an album about the anxiety of living in the computer age um, and information age in general or age of um, instant travel. Um, I mean, track one is Airbag, which is about <laughs> surviving a car crash, which I love because um, I think I read an interview with Tom York, who wrote the song, talking about after he had a bad car accident, he wanted to get out of the car and and scream and um, scream with with joy that he was still alive, and he doesn't know why not everybody does that if they're uninjured in a in an accident thanks to their airbag, but. Um, and then you got Paranoid Android, Subterranean, Homesick Alien, which back to Paranoid Android is you hear it compared a lot to Bohemian Rhapsody um, in terms of just you know having different sections or you could call them movements even, um, which I think is pretty fair. Um, I think that one would probably appeal to a lot of the classic rock guys out there if you've never heard that song. Um, Subterranean, Homesick Alien is great. Exit Music for a Film was one of my favorite Radiohead tracks. Uh, the build up to um, the bridge section or, or right before the last verse. I'm um, sorry, my voice is getting a little tired because I've been talking for half an hour, wow. Um, uh, the build up into the last verse is probably my favorite musical moment of all time or up there. There's a lot of those on this record. Um, again, the next track, Let Down, the same thing with the last, um, the last verse going into the chorus, similar kind of build up. Karma Police, which has a huge outro, which I really love. Uh, Fit or Happier, which is kind of a creepy um, computer-generated voice going through like a almost like a grocery list of um, how to be a functioning member of society. Electioneering, all about um, you know um, voodoo economics and um, gerrymandering and all those things. Climbing up the walls, kind of an exploration into mental health. Um, no surprises. Talking about this, um, you could call it the American dream. Um, you know, I'll take a quiet life, uh, a handshake of carbon monoxide. Um, Lucky, again, another thing about, the last two tracks are uh, also about the um, anxieties of travel. You have Lucky, which is about an uh, airplane crash, and then The Tourist, which is about um, almost getting run over by someone speeding down a road while you're walking along um, with the, the brilliant chorus of Hey Man, Slow Down. <laughs> Um, which I'm kind of selling it short, but that's that's literally the lyrics of the song. Anyways, um, this pressing is uh, not an original or anything, but it's not the most recent, like 2017 or even 2016 pressing either. It's like a 2014 or something, and it has a, an American Capitol Records jacket, but it's got um, British uh, Parlophone labels. You can see them there. And it's British pressing 
in an American jacket. It was kind of weird. Um, I kind of lucked out because back then, this was apparently the best way to get the best sound out of the record. You could go for an original UK or US for that matter, which are expensive, um, or you could try to find one in an American cover like this with the British records inside, which you just kind of have to wait and see and hope you get those, which I did. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's okay. Computer number one record of all time in in my my book. Um, let me guys let me know what you guys think about this um, this record if you like this one or if you like low or you know if you like I don't know if you like blonde on blonde let me know what you guys think is the best out of all these and um, that's my list it's been months I've been doing this since what like November and now it's almost March and I just finished it so thank you guys for sticking with it um, thanks VC in general for just being awesome I'm been really excited by all the stuff going on in the VC with um, all the great contests and um, I've been getting inspired to make new series. Um, I've got a couple things in the works in addition to just, you know, showing recent pickups and all that. But anyway, I want to congrat congratulate um, Danny from uh, Not Enough Records for passing 100 subs. If you're watching this, I know I haven't made a video entry for your contest yet, but I'm working on it. Yours kind of requires um, a little bit of a uh, thought and preparation, so I'm making sure I'm going to have a good video for that. And Jeff Kempen, I will have an entry for your contest up probably this weekend. Um, yours, um, I don't think will take as long to uh, put together, um, but I'm looking forward to entering both of those. If I can, I'm going to enter H2 Vinyls contest as well, and um, hopefully that won't be an overflow of contest entries. But um, but yeah, that's that's all I've got for this video. This is running really long. I think this is the longest video on my channel now. But um, just thank you guys so much. I, I don't know what to say for all the support I've gotten. I think I'm close to, uh, I'm over 250 subs and um, just working my way up there. Um, thank you all my old subscribers, new subscribers, people that don't subscribe on purpose, people that um, have skipped ahead to this part of the video or skip to each um, each number on my list and have now clicked out of this video. Thank you guys, even though you're not watching this. Um, thanks just in general to everybody. This, this whole YouTube thing is really fun. Um, fun way to just, you know, put myself out there. So uh, I don't know what I'm even talking about anymore. Just thank you. I hope you guys have a good week. I hope you guys have enjoyed the series again. It was a lot of fun. And again, I'm looking forward to uh, a lot of you guys' entries and the um, the finale of uh, Jeff Kempen's 100 top 100 records, and um, trying to think of anyone else who is still doing it slash will be doing it in the future. I'd like to see actually um, Jay, if you're watching this vinyl in the band, I'd like to see your top 100. Not to like call you out or anything. If you don't want to do it, that's cool. <laughs> but um, I just think it's fun. I'd be really curious to see if. Uh, if you could, um, I know it's hard to, to get them all in a, in a list, which it seems kind of arbitrary at some points, but it's just, it's just fun. I'd like to see a hundred records in general. It doesn't even have to be a weekly series like this. You could just run through them on, you know, two seconds each, but that's all I've got. This video has <laughs> gotten really rambly. Sorry. Um, appreciate it. I'll leave it there. Uh, take care of you. See.